Welcome to Jordan. This is the land where so many of the great dramas of the Bible took place. It's felt the footsteps of numerous Bible figures, not least Moses, Elijah, John the Baptist and Jesus himself. It's a land of the most extraordinary contrasts, from the lush, fertile pasture land of the Jordan Valley to the scorching deserts, from the Dead Sea, the lowest place on earth, to the sparkling sophistication of Amman, the capital, the white city, its limestone buildings gleaming in the sun. Abraham and his nephew Lot are the first to step onto the scene around 2000 BC. When their herdsmen started quarrelling over the land, Abraham very generously let Lot have first choice. And Lot, not surprisingly, but rather selfishly, chose the best for himself. He looked up and he saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the Garden of the Lord. It's one of the most fertile places in the Middle East. So he and Abraham parted company. Lot pitched his tents near here, around the Dead Sea and the evil city of Sodom itself. This is the lowest part of the Earth's surface, over 400 metres below sea level and part of the Great Rift Valley. Archaeology has confirmed that at that time this area had ample water and was well populated. Sodom's citizens had certainly chosen an attractive spot. As the inhabitants of Sodom were renowned for their wickedness, Lot was really putting himself in temptation's way by choosing to live so near. At first he was content to admire the view of Sodom, but then he moved into the city itself. Later, Lot was warned that God's judgment was about to fall on this notoriously wicked city. God's angels warned him, flee for your life. Don't look back or stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you'll be swept away. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur upon Sodom and Gomorrah. He overthrew those cities and the entire plain. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. To this day, this lofty pinnacle and the grotesque salt formations here are reminders of her folly. Even Jesus cited her as a warning of disobedience. Remember Lot's wife. She obviously was not in too great a hurry to escape from the city whose wicked ways she had probably come to love. Lot and his two daughters survived and fled to the hills. The ruins of this monastery, built by the Byzantines in the 6th century, stand beside the cave where Lot and his daughters took refuge. The Byzantines built a church right in front of it in commemoration of these most dramatic events. It stands high on the hillside above Zohar. The Bible says that the sun was rising as Lot reached here. These ancient remains of the walled towns of Bavedra and Umera are the best available candidates to be the actual ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah. They still show the results of fiery destruction in the early Bronze Age, after which they were never inhabited again. Jesus used Sodom as an example of the judgment that will surely come to all who reject God's ways. And Peter said that God has made the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. Those who doubt the reality of God's judgments in the future should spare a thought for the reality of his judgments in the past. Abraham's grandson Jacob was the next to have a dramatic encounter with God here in Jordan 
and right beside this river Jabbok too. What fear gripped him right here? Twenty years earlier, he had stolen his brother Esau's birthright and he'd had to flee from his homeland as Esau was vowing to kill him. Now God had told Jacob to return. Go back to the land of your fathers. I will be with you. But what reception would he get? Was Esau still after his life? He'd just heard that Esau was coming to meet him with 400 men. Jacob didn't like the sound of those 400 men. So here by the banks of the river, he prayed fervently. O oh God of my father Abraham and Isaac, save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau. He divided his people, flocks and herds into two groups, thinking that if Esau attacked one of them, the others might escape. And he sent his entire company across this river. He himself was left alone in the gathering gloom, totally alone. That night, a most mysterious event took place beside the banks of this river. Jacob was about to re-enter the Promised Land. And we are told in one of the most mysterious passages in the Bible that God wrestled with Jacob. Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. God said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you've struggled with God and with men and you've overcome. So here, by the banks of this river, the nation of Israel got her name, and the people of God their characterization. People who wrestle in prayer with God that his will may be done. Several hundred years after these events, the Bible records the great drama of the Exodus, which marked the emergence of Moses as the greatest Old Testament figure. The first town in, uh, in southern Jordan mentioned in the great Exodus drama is Etzion Geba, a port town at or near Jordan's Red Sea port resort of Aqaba. This is Jordan's only outlet to the sea and a popular holiday destination. Almost 60% of Jordan's imports and exports pass via here, so the port's strategic to the country's economy. Aqaba's location is unique. Eilat in Israel is only 10 minutes away, and Saudi Arabia is just 20 kilometers down the coast. Egypt itself is only a swift 45-minute hydrofoil trip across the water. The people of Israel must have been thrilled by this sight of the sea after all their years in the wilderness. The children who'd grown up in the wilderness had now become adults. It's most likely that they'd been put through courses of military training under Joshua's direction. This was a generation that would be bearing the bulk of the fighting when they came to enter Canaan. But even before then, there'd still be stiff opposition along the way and it was going to test their resolve and their military capabilities to the utmost. So off they set, northwards along this King's Highway. It's the world's oldest continuously used communication route. The main caravan route from the south to Damascus and Mesopotamia in the north. They were not the generation that had left Egypt. These were the children of that generation and they'd grown up in the wilderness. Their parents had all died in that wilderness because of their constant provocation of the Lord. He had sworn in his anger that they would not enter the promised land. Their bones would whiten in the wilderness. The route passed first through the territory of the descendants of Esau, who lived in Seir, the land of the Edomites. God told them not to provoke these, their blood relatives, to war, because he had already given Esau the hill country of Seir as his possession. So Moses sent a polite request to the king of Edom, asking for permission to pass through his land. Unfortunately, he refused, and he came out against them with a large and powerful army. 
This show of force caused Moses to turn aside and make a lengthy detour around Edom in order to avoid any chance of conflict with this brother nation. In the same way, God told them not to harass the Moabites further north or the Ammonites. They too were blood relatives, descendants of Lot, and the Lord had given them their land as well. It was not to be taken over. Israel was to take over only those lands on this eastern side of the Jordan which were further north, in the hands of the Amorites. It was here, near the border with Edom, that the Lord summoned Moses and Aaron to the top of Mount Hor, just over there behind me. He told Moses to take Aaron's garments and put them on Aaron's son Eleazar. Aaron was to die here. He would not enter the Promised Land because both he and Moses had rebelled against the Lord's commands at the waters of Meribah. A Byzantine church and later an Islamic shrine tomb were built on the summit. The people of Israel mourned for Aaron for 30 days. Aaron is remembered particularly for the beautiful priestly blessing which the Lord commanded him to give to the people of Israel. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And so the epic journey continued and they arrived at the Arnon, this great wadi that served as the border between Moab and the region of the Ammonites. It's no less awesome in its desolation today than it must have appeared to them then. The territory north of this great gorge was ruled by Zion, king of the Amorites. Zion's capital was here at Heshbon. Once again, Moses sent a polite request, this time to Zion, asking permission to pass through his land. But Zion's response was a refusal. He turned out his full forces against Israel. But this time, the Israelite forces stood their ground and Zion's forces suffered an overwhelming defeat. This was the Israelites' first decisive battle, and the new generation proved their mettle. They routed Zion's forces and captured Heshbon. Much of its tell is still awaiting excavation, but there's enough evidence here to suggest that this was indeed Zion's capital. They took not only this city, but all his cities, and then moved on further north to take all 60 cities of Og, king of Bashan, as well. Israel was so proud of these victories against overwhelming odds that even to this day they're still celebrated in the Passover festival. Centuries after these events, an early Christian church was built on the tell itself. The ruin of its apse is still clearly visible. These caves in the hillside opposite have been the dwelling places of some of Heshbon's citizens through the ages. It's only recently that they've moved into the more modern accommodation above. Seeing the abundance of fertile grazing land here prompted the tribes of Reuben, Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh to ask Moses to give them this territory, the kingdom of Zion and Og, as their inheritance. Moses agreed, but only on condition that they cross the Jordan to fight with their fellow tribes for their own inheritance in the Promised Land. Its conquest must be the undertaking of all Israel. Then the two and a half tribes could return to rejoin their families here in their possession on this eastern side of the river. So it was right here, on the plains of Moab, just north of the Dead Sea, that Israel were getting ready to launch their attack on Canaan. Balak, king of Moab, was naturally terrified of Israel's presence, buoyed up as they were with their recent terrific success over Sion. He didn't realize that Israel had no plans against him because God had forbidden such attack. He realized that there was no military way in which he could resist Israel, so he tried to oppose them through pagan divination. He sent for Balaam, a diviner with an international reputation. So Balaam climbed three mountaintops around Mount Nebo to curse Israel for Balak. But he found he was unable to do so. God kept him from pronouncing a curse on his people. Instead, he found himself pronouncing the most exquisite blessings on them. 
How fair are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel, like valleys that stretch afar, like gardens beside a river, like aloes that the Lord has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters. Balak, king of Moab, was furious. What have you done? I brought you here to curse my enemies, and you've done nothing but bless them. Balaam's answer was simple. How can I curse those whom God has not cursed? But he soon came up with his own plan for defeating Israel. He advised the Midianites, in league with Balak, to seduce the Israelites to engage in sexual immorality with the Midianite women and to worship their God. As a result, the Lord sent a plague on Israel in which 24,000 people died. Then the Lord told Moses to take vengeance over the Midianites. So they fought against them, they killed every man, and the five kings of Midian, and Balaam himself. It was here, east of the Jordan, that Moses delivered his final address and instructions to the people of Israel. It was here that he uttered the words which were to become the most famous words in the Hebrew prayer book, uttered by Jews around the world to this very day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Here too, Moses blessed the tribes. There is none like God, O Jeshurun, who rides through the heavens to your help and in his majesty through the skies. The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And so the epic journey is almost over. Through the howling wilderness, across trackless deserts, God had led his people with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And now they were within actual sight of the promised land. How Moses longed to be allowed to cross the Jordan and into the land. Here at Beth Peor, where the water flows out of the solid rock behind me, he pleaded with the Lord to be allowed to do so. But the Lord said to him, that is enough. Speak to me no more about this matter. Go up to the top of Pisgah and see the land with your own eyes. Since you are not going to cross this Jordan, you will die on this mountain. And so the book of Deuteronomy ends with the death of Moses, the end of an unforgettable and unrepeatable era in the life of the nation. At God's command, Moses climbed Mount Nebo, right there behind me, and the Lord showed him the whole land. The Lord told him, this is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. If ever there was a moment of supreme triumph mingled with supreme disappointment, this must surely have been it. Triumph because he had led God's people from slavery to within actual sight of the promised land. Disappointment because he himself was not to be permitted to enter it. And yet, did he know did this great man of God sense in his spirit that for him, God had prepared something even better? He would be crossing not this river Jordan, but the river of death, to enter not this promised land, but that heavenly land which God has prepared for all who love him. This is the most revered site in Jordan, and the church complex and its beautiful gardens are lovingly tended by the Franciscan brothers. Beneath the modern roof lie the remains of several churches which have been built here over the centuries to commemorate the momentous climax of Moses' life. The apse itself is the oldest part. It was built in the 4th century. 
The altar legs of a later church still stand in its own apse, uh, with the remains of yet another church behind. One of Jordan's best preserved mosaic floors beautifies the church on the left, while outside a plaque reminds us that while the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. This is graphically illustrated by the memorial marking the summit. It's a representation of the bronze serpent which Moses lifted up in the wilderness. All who had been bitten by snakes could look at it and live. Jesus said that in the same way he himself would be lifted up on the cross so that all who believe in his sacrifice might have eternal life. This is indeed a deeply significant sight for Jews, Christians and Muslims. And to pray here in the church is for many an overwhelmingly moving experience. And so here on the top of Mount Nebo, Moses, the great prophet and lawgiver, died, just as his brother Aaron had died on Mount Hor. And in the valley opposite, he's buried. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day. It must be very close to me right now. For thousands of years, this area in the centre of Jordan's capital has been famous for its springs and acropolis. Most visitors to Jordan start here in Amman, the ancient Rabat Amon or Rabbah, the citadel and capital of the ancient Ammonites. This has always been a strategic location. Its lofty, commanding position has enabled its citizens to exert powerful control over the surrounding area. The city was originally built on seven hills. Now it spreads over 19. The White City, that's how Amman was affectionately known. Its stone buildings positively gleam in the sun. Around one and a half million people live here and the population's growing all the time. Almost half of the inhabitants of Jordan live right here in Amman and its surroundings. It's because of its dominating situation that the city's always been inhabited. Archaeologists are still busily at work, uncovering evidence of the site's Bronze Age inhabitants of 6,000 years ago, not to mention artefacts from the later Iron Age and the Roman, Christian and Muslim periods too. The Roman Temple of Hercules dominates the lofty citadel today. It was built in the 2nd century AD in honour of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. These are two of the original four columns of its facade, still standing with their tripartite architrave on top. This was the same site on which the much earlier Ammonite temple of Milcom once stood. Milcom was one of the gods of the Ammonites. The much smaller stones of the Ammonite temple are clearly visible beneath the much larger and later stones of the Roman one. Very near are the remains of the massive walls of the Ammonite fortifications. Israelite forces besieged the city around 1000 BC and it was here that King David arranged for Uriah the Hittite to die in battle in order to cover up his adultery with Uriah's wife Bathsheba. David's told Joab, his army commander, to put Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he'd be struck down and die. It must have happened around these very walls. Even in those far-off days, the city comprised its upper and lower parts. The lower city is today's downtown Amman. Very lively, noisy and colourful it is too. Above all this noise and bustle tower the walls of the Ammonite citadel, an ever-present reminder of a bygone age. As we've already seen, it was up there, possibly against those very walls, that Uriah the Hittite was killed in battle. 
It's good to find a peaceful spot in which to relax, right in the heart of this great city. And where better than in these peaceful gardens, right in front of the Roman theatre. The palm trees provide welcome relief from the heat of the midday sun. The theatre was built in the second century AD and it seats 6,000 spectators. Well, I don't know how the elderly and infirm ever managed to cope with these. Well, I think it really is worth it. The view from up here really is stupendous. The city was known as Philadelphia in Roman times, and it was part of the Decapolis, a confederation of ten towns characterized by their high Greek culture. Just south of Amman is the ancient city of Madaba, known as the City of Mosaics. Its Greek Orthodox Church of St. George was built in 1896 over the remains of a Byzantine church whose floor was decorated with this incredible mosaic map of Jerusalem and the Holy Land. It dates from around 560 AD. Only a part of the map has been preserved. It originally measured a staggering 15 and a half by 5 and a half metres and it was made from more than 2 million pieces of coloured stone. The map reaches as far as the Nile Delta, and it's full of hills and valleys, villages and towns. The detail is astonishing. The fish in the Jordan are even swimming upstream to get away from the salty water of the Dead Sea. Here's Mount Sinai and the Sinai Desert. There are 157 captions in Greek, and the different sizes of lettering indicate the relative importance of the towns. Is Ashkelon and Ashdod. The walled city of Jerusalem dominates the map. Here's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and on the left, the Damascus Gate, with Trajan's Column, and from it, the Roman Cardo runs the length of the city. Here's Bethlehem, just south of Jerusalem, and Jericho, the city of palm trees, with the walled city clearly portrayed. The River Jordan flows southwards. The boat is at the fords where people used to be able to cross, and on it flows into the Dead Sea. On the eastern bank of the Jordan is the site of Jesus' baptism itself, Enun Saf Saf, nearby the willow tree. It was its inclusion on this map, and similarly that of Lot's cave at Zohar, that contributed to the recent discovery of these actual sites. The map was intended to benefit the 6th century pilgrims on their way to visit the biblical locations. Hidden deep amongst the formidable canyons of southern Jordan and lost for centuries in this awesome landscape lies the country's best-known tourist attraction, the incredibly dramatic ancient city of Petra. The only access to the city is through this narrow gorge, or seek as it's called. Indeed, much of Petra's appeal comes from its spectacular setting and this most dramatic approach. As an added attraction, visitors can choose their mode of transport from the site's entrance to the seek itself. It seems wholly appropriate to approach one of the world's greatest and most ancient wonders in this time-honoured fashion. This area offered safe haven to numerous people in antiquity, but is most associated with the Nabataeans. They were an Arab population of traders and caravanners who moved in from the south they immediately appreciated just how unassailable this site would be. It's clear to see just how easy it was for the Nabataeans to defend the city against the Greeks and the Romans because this was the only known approach to the city at that time. Along the sides are a water channel and a water pipe which used to bring in the city's water supply. The route winds on ever closer to the city itself. Here we are, the end of the Seek, 
and the first glimpse of uh, Petra's most famous facade, the Treasury. It's truly one of the wonders of the world, and it's an awesome moment to emerge from the Sikh to be confronted by such an edifice. It was deliberately sited here by the Nabataeans to create awe in all of their visitors, and to show the greatness of their civilization. It's no less astounding even today. The Nabataeans carved it out of the solid rock in the first century BC as a tomb for their king. Its colourful guards protect it from the ravages of today's visitors, and they're quite a tourist attraction themselves. The remarkable state of preservation is thanks to the towering rock walls, which have provided protection from erosion by wind and sand for 2,000 years. These Nabataeans were originally nomads, wandering with their camels around the Arabian Peninsula. But they soon realized the strategic importance of this site for trade, and they began to settle here around the 6th century BC, carving out homes in the cliffs. Very simple dwellings indeed. They believed strongly in life after death, and so they attached far more importance to their tombs than to their homes. These spectacular tombs of their kings are also carved out of the solid rock, a truly amazing constructional feat. The urn tomb behind me is one of the Nabataean royal tombs, and it was carved from the solid rock in the first century. Next to it are other royal tombs, the so-called silk tomb, the Corinthian tomb, and the palace tomb. Petra was uh, the main station on the great trading route, the frankincense trading route, which came from Arabia in the south uh, northwards. The great trading caravans bearing their precious cargoes of frankincense and myrrh would have stopped here to rest and indeed to do business. One ancient tradition maintains that the wise men on their way to visit Jesus uh, possibly stopped here and they may even have purchased their frankincense and myrrh right here in Petra. The Nabataeans exported the frankincense and myrrh to Greece and Rome at enormous profit. That's how they became so wealthy. From here, they dominated the trade routes of ancient Arabia. It may well be that it was right here that the tradesmen rested their camels while they unloaded their precious cargoes. The Romans had to pay the Nabataeans so much for these two precious commodities that they were keen to capture the city. But it was so easy for the Nabataeans to defend it because of its narrow entrance. Another of the most striking monuments in Petra is the Deir, easily the next most impressive to the treasury itself. It's not all that easy to reach. In fact, this is the start of the 800 steps which lead up to it. Donkeys are available for those who can't face the climb. And quite a climb it is, through terrain which is increasingly awesome in its desolation. It was Amaziah, king of Judah, who, the Bible records, smote the men of Seir. The men of Judah took 10,000 prisoners to the top of a rock, probably in this very region, and threw them down. They were all dashed to pieces. It's a suitably chilling memory in such a spot as this. <laughs> Finally, the track emerges at the top, and the first sight of the day year makes it all worthwhile. The layout of the facade is similar to that of the treasury. There's a central tholos, topped by an urn, and flanked by the two side wings. This site was one of the Nabataean high places, and the donkeys are now feeding where the Nabataeans' open-air altars for animal sacrifices would have stood right in front of the Deir itself. And there are also refreshments available to fortify intrepid travellers for their descent.
In the middle of the 9th century BC, the great prophet Elijah erupted onto the scene. He was born over there at Tishbe, right on top of the mountain behind me, one of the mountains of Gilead. In the 6th century AD, the Christians built a church on the top of the mountain to commemorate the site as that of Elijah's actual birthplace. The Department of Antiquities started their explorations here in 1999. They were part of Jordan's preparations for the millennium, which included the discovery and excavation of more of their biblical sites. Everyone was amazed and excited about uncovering this once very beautiful church with its exquisite mosaic floor. It's one of the largest churches in Jordan, and like almost all in the country, it's built in basilica style, with three naves and its eastward-facing apse. It enjoys spectacular views out over the mountains of Gilead, where Elijah probably grew up and worked as a shepherd. It's one of the greenest areas in Jordan, with considerable rainfall. The monks and locals lived around the church, conscious that this area was very significant in the life of the great prophet. Elijah was probably a descendant of one of the two and a half tribes of Israel who received their inheritance on this side of the River Jordan. Elijah's name means, the Lord is my God. That was his name, that was his message. He was sent by God to vigorously oppose the Baal worship which King Ahab was introducing in Israel under the influence of his evil wife Jezebel. It's quite possible that this rugged terrain may well have played its part in shaping Elijah's own very rugged character. It must have been here, as Elijah grew up, that he became aware of God's calling on his life. And it must have been here too that the realisation gradually dawned on him that it was he himself who was to confront the evil King Ahab with his sins, that it was he who was to announce to the wicked king God's judgment on him, that there would be no dew or rain except at his word. Then Elijah fled to hide from Ahab's wrath by the brook Cherith. Its water today provides luxurious growth in this otherwise parched and barren wilderness. Here, at God's command, Elijah was fed by the ravens, who brought food to the solitary prophet day by day. Here, he had to learn to trust that God would indeed give him each day his daily bread. So it was here that Elijah proved God in private, an essential preparation for the later great test on Mount Carmel, where he was able to display a relaxed confidence in God's absolute power. For nearly 2,000 years, this area, just across the river from Jericho, has been identified as the place where Jesus was baptised by John. Stunning archaeological discoveries here since 1996 have confirmed that this was indeed Bethany beyond the Jordan, where John was living when he baptised Jesus. It's the combined evidence of the Old and New Testaments which have led Dr Mohammed Wahim to this conclusion together with the records of the early 4th century pilgrims and the archaeological excavations themselves. Indeed, this is not only the site of Bethany beyond the Jordan, but also that of Elijah's most dramatic departure before the very eyes of his startled successor, Elisha. As they were walking together, suddenly horses and chariots of fire appeared and Elijah was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind from this very hill behind me. This whole hill had to be excavated from beneath the rubble and the debris of the centuries. Elijah is one of the towering figures of the Old Testament, and over a score of references to him pepper the New Testament too. The Old Testament ends with Malachi's prophecy that God will again send Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Jewish expectation has always been that Elijah will reappear to herald the Messiah's imminent arrival. This expectation appears to have been so great in the years and centuries following his dramatic departure that people started coming to live here, to be on hand for his return. So 
it's deeply significant that 800 years after Elijah's dramatic departure from this earthly scene, who should appear here on virtually the same site but John the Baptist, whom Christians believe to have been that great herald of the Messiah. It's here that his climactic challenge rang out, prepare the way of the Lord. It's one of the most important holy sites in Jordan. On top of the hill, the early Christians built a kind of monastery with churches, caves and baptism pools. They were deeply conscious of the momentous events which had occurred earlier on this site. This cave, known as John the Baptist's cave, was used as the apse of a 5th to 6th century church. It's clear that John's ministry was uniquely effective. Great crowds flocked to listen to him. For nearly 400 years, no prophet had arisen to speak the words of God, and people were hungry for some genuine message from God. And in John, they heard it. This man from the desert had obviously given himself the chance to hear the word of God. What's more, he was a totally humble figure, absolutely compelling. It was right here that he uttered his momentous identification of Jesus. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Even before its association with Jesus, this place has been revered for its associations with Moses and Joshua, Elijah and Elisha. So this has been sacred ground for over 3,000 years. It was somewhere here, along the banks of the Jordan, that Jesus was baptised. But the exact location has long been a source of speculation. It's only since the peace accord with Israel in 1994 that work on definite identification has been possible. Before then, this was a heavily mined military area. Today, the path leads to the discoveries themselves. Archaeologist Roston has studied the Old and New Testaments and the descriptions of this site by the pilgrims who came here as early as the 4th century AD. This dig is providing dramatic confirmation of the accuracy of their accounts. This is considered to be the actual site where Jesus was baptised and all the archaeological evidence points to the truth of that. It's below this awning that the ruins of the Church of John the Baptist are being uncovered. The early pilgrims of the 4th century relate that it had been built to commemorate the exact location where Jesus had been baptised. It was built on four foundations and spanned the river at this very point where the water from the brook Cherith flowed into the Jordan. The Jordan no longer flows here, of course, it's changed course many times over the centuries and it's now about 300 metres to the west. So much of its water has been channelled off upstream for various purposes that its flow here is now only about 1% of that when Jesus was baptised. This is the lowest place on earth, but as the locals say, it's the closest to the heavens. Here the heavens opened, the Spirit descended as a dove, and Jesus heard the voice of God, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Beneath this shelter, the ruins of succeeding churches are being unearthed, themselves dramatic confirmation of the significance of this site to the earliest Christians. As they determined to commemorate this site for all time, so now the present-day Jordanians are zealous to protect this great heritage and to make it readily accessible for today's 21st century pilgrims they're deeply conscious that this is a heritage to be shared with the whole world. On this eastern side of the Dead Sea, and high in the desert hills just above it, stands the mountaintop fortress of Machairus. It's one of the loneliest, grimmest and most unassailable fortresses in the world. And according to Josephus, the great historian of the time, it was here that Herod had John the Baptist imprisoned, probably in one of the caves at the foot of the mountain.
Herod had seduced and married his own brother's wife. And John had had the incredible courage to tell him that what he had done was not right in the sight of God. Herodias, the lady in question, was furious, and she wanted to kill John. So it appears that Herod had John imprisoned here, not so much to stop John getting out as to stop Herodias' henchmen getting in to kill him. Herod's conscience merely confirmed what John had already been telling him. Herod knew that he had done wrong in God's sight. He knew that John was a good and godly man, and he liked to listen to him, even though he became greatly disturbed each time he heard him. Perhaps some of their conversations took place in these very caves. It's little wonder that he grew depressed. Chained up here in this frightful fortress, in the stifling heat beside the Dead Sea, the lowest place on earth. It's from here that he sent messengers to Jesus with his sad question. Ask him, are you the one John said was going to come, or should we look for someone else? Jesus told them to go back and tell John what they'd seen and heard. The blind can see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Jesus was doing the very things which Isaiah the prophet had predicted 700 years earlier would be the sign that God had come to save his people. In the very north of Jordan, with spectacular views out over to Tiberias, across the sparkling waters of the Sea of Galilee, and perched on top of its surrounding hills, is Um Kais, the site of the Roman city of Gadara. It's famous for the biblical story of the Gadarene swine. The demon-possessed man who accosted Jesus as he stepped ashore after crossing the lake probably came from here. This Byzantine church from the 4th century is built right on top of the Roman tombs from which we believe that this man came out to meet Jesus. The people who built the church ensured that there was an opening right in the centre which looked down into the tomb. The tomb's quite some way below present ground level and it's built to contain several bodies. Certainly a very impressive structure. So it was down here that this demon-possessed man almost certainly lived. He'd often been chained up, but he had a supernatural strength and he broke them all. People were terrified of him. Chains have been found here, not these ones intended to stop people getting in, but the actual ones probably intended to stop him getting out. So it was from here that he set out to meet Jesus. What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? The man was screaming because Jesus had already commanded the evil spirits to leave him. He gave them permission to enter a herd of pigs who immediately rushed over the steep hillside into the lake and were drowned. In his gratitude, the man begged Jesus to be allowed to go with him. But Jesus said, no, go back home and tell them of the great things God has done for you. So back from the lakeside he must have come, up these same hills, positively bursting to tell his amazing story. He was to be the very first missionary to the Gentile world. This is the very Roman road along which that happy and restored man almost certainly made his way back to the town to tell them all of the great things which God had done for him, just as Jesus had told him to. And what a city in which to start. It was one of the cities of the Decapolis, a confederation of ten towns characterised by their high Greek culture. The man's story would be sure to spread like wildfire, far and wide. The ruts of Roman chariot wheels are still clearly visible in the Cardo, the main colonnaded street. 
It's paved in the black basalt stone, which is characteristic of the whole town. Even the mausoleum itself was built with this same material, as was the stunning theatre. The stone was brought from the volcanic area down in the Jordan Valley. The cool breeze up here, high above the lake, is exceptionally invigorating, and the views are really tremendous. Syria lies in the distance, and the Golan Heights rise majestically above the Yarmouk River. Jesus passed through this region of the Decapolis on his return to the Sea of Galilee after his extended excursion north to Tyre and Sidon. It was possibly here, in Gadara itself, that people declared, he's done everything well. And it was certainly around here that Jesus ordered the evil spirits, who had been afflicting Gadara's tomb dweller, to leave him and to enter the herd of pigs who immediately rushed down the steep hills into the lake and were drowned. So Gadara too may well have felt the footsteps of Jesus himself. Even more spectacularly preserved and restored than Um Kais is Jerash, and our happy and renewed man must surely have told the good news of his deliverance by Jesus here too. Jerash is simply stunning. Its strategic location on the main trade route between the south and north made it one of the most important cities of the Decapolis. During its heyday in the 2nd century AD, about 20 to 30,000 people were living here. The Gerasians were very proud of their city. Its wealth can clearly be discerned from the remains of its theatres, temples, streets and marketplaces. This is the Cardo here at Gerash. The Cardo was the main street in all Roman cities, comes from the Latin meaning heart. So this was the uh, heart of the city and all the main activities took place around it. It's 800 metres long and it's intersected by smaller colonnaded side streets. This impressive tetrapylon is at one such crossroads. The Cardo was once flanked by porticos, and over 500 of their columns still exist. Many still have their capitals. It leads straight into one of the most important features of any Roman city, the Forum. Here in Gerash, it's called the Oval Plaza because of its spectacular oval shape. It was built in the first century AD and was probably one of the main meeting places of the people. Here they may well have discussed war and peace, politics and trade. This encircling colonnade is well preserved. Its 56 ionic columns are surmounted by their tripartite architraves. The shops behind them would all have opened out onto the plaza itself. This podium in the centre dates from Roman times and it was probably used by orators as they addressed the crowds. Today, the column on it holds the torch of the Gerash International Festival. Great crowds used to follow Jesus from these Decapolis cities. That was probably how the demon-possessed man had got to hear of him. What's more, Jesus may well have occasionally passed through here himself. This is one of the city's two theatres, built during the reign of Domitian towards the end of the first century AD. This lower tier of the stage wall is sumptuously decorated with these colonnades, niches and monumental gates, which are still in a remarkable state of preservation. Like all these Roman theatres, the acoustic here is absolutely amazing. I can be heard perfectly clearly by everyone in all its 3,000 seats. It's quite a climb to the top, as it is up this imposing stairway to the Temple of Artemis, set high on its lofty podium. Artemis was the protecting divinity of the city. These elegant Corinthian columns are incredibly impressive even today. These massive blocks are 11 metres high and they've been built to sway slightly in the wind. There's a metal bar between each of the sections. 
And for that reason, they've never fallen down through the centuries. They've even withstood the several earthquakes that have occurred. So this is as they've always stood. They've never had to be re-erected. But although they've stood the test of time, the worship of Artemis certainly hasn't. Her statue would have stood in this sacred room. But before long, such worship would be seen as an anachronism, while belief in Jesus as the Son of God would be sweeping inexorably throughout the Roman Empire, reaching even Rome itself within but a few years. Indeed, such was the spread of the good news of Jesus that there were no fewer than 16 churches here in Gerash by the 6th century. This one, with its magnificent mosaic floor, was dedicated to Cosmos and Damian, two dearly loved physicians from Arabia who were persecuted and martyred by the Romans because of their faith in Jesus. But even so, such persecution was powerless to prevent the good news of Jesus from going out from here into all the world. So this Holy Land of Jordan, together with the Holy Land of Israel across the river, are the lands chosen by God in which to reveal and fulfil his purposes over the centuries. Plans and purposes too great to be fulfilled within a single lifetime or even century. Even to this day, the River Jordan itself remains as powerful a symbol of those plans as ever. Smaller by far than many of the great rivers of this world, and yet in the hearts and minds of countless millions through the ages, it far surpasses them all. The people of God crossed these waters to enter and inherit the Promised Land, the Ark of the Covenant shielding them from the river's deadly danger. Ever since then, believers have seen that event as a symbol of the day of our own passage through death. On that day, all our pretensions will be swept aside. All that will count on that day will be our faith and trust in the Lamb of God and in His sacrifice to bring us safe through Jordan to that promised land which God has prepared for all who love Him.